Hello, we're rolling into another episode of the DRA show. As usual, in each episode, I'll be talking to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well being. Today, I'm joined by an author and an educational psychologist. He's an associate professor of psychology at Utah Valley University. Dr. Russell Wan, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. It's great to have you here, Dr. Wan. So let's start off with you telling us your backstory, your trajectory in life, and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Yeah, um, well, I always wanted to be a psychologist, um, but when I was a teenager, I thought that psychologists always worked with helping people get through their problems. Um, I didn't know there were other types of psychologists. And when I was a freshman in college, I took abnormal psychology and we had to spend some time volunteering at a local inpatient mental health facility, a mental hospital. And I knew within 15 minutes that I did not want to be a clinician. I did not want to deal with mental health challenges and help people with their problems. But I stuck to the major because um, I still like learning about people. And I discovered educational psychology, mostly through testing. And I really liked that area. And that's why I went to graduate school at Texas A&M for is educational psychology with the emphasis in research measurement and statistics. And while I was there, I had to take um, courses in giftedness, gifted education and um, testing and intelligence testing kept popping up a lot in those courses. And so I um, got sucked into that world and um, I earned my PhD nine years ago and fast forward to now, and I now have a book coming out about intelligence. Um, definitely not what I planned when I imagined, oh, I want to be a psychologist. I didn't imagine I'd be writing a book um, telling the world about the research um, about this area. And you, you just mentioned that you wrote a book about intelligence. So right off the bat, um, what would you say is the greatest myth about intelligence? I know there are 35 on your book, which we'll talk more about in detail later, but what would you say is the greatest myth? Uh, the greatest myth by far that I've seen is that just the idea that standardized tests, whether they're intelligence tests or college admissions tests or, or achievement tests for the end of the school year, um, that these tests are, are biased. And that's simply not true. Um, intelligence tests, that, that argument was put to rest in the 80s. And in the the um, ethical standards of test development that the whole industry has adopted make it pretty much impossible to sell a test that's biased against um, people who speak the language the test is in as a native um, and who live in the country that, that the test is customized for. And so um, you get far too many people saying, oh, well, you know, intelligence tests, those are those are biased against Hispanics. Those are biased against African-Americans. Those are biased against this group, that group. Um, it's not true. That's by far the, the myth I hear the most. And um, that is the topic of I'm looking at it. Um, test uh, chapter 10. That's myth number 10 in the book. Um, and that's the one I hear the most. And that, that, of course, leads me to my next question. Um, inevitably, when we talk about um, intelligence, um, the topic of IQ pops up. So is IQ the same as intelligence? No, um, IQ is the measure of intelligence. Um, and it seems like I'm splitting hairs here. And when, when I teach this to my students, they, they say the same thing. They say, uh, it doesn't seem like there's a big difference. Um, just like when you step on the bathroom scale to, to measure your weight, the number you get is not your weight. It's a measurement of your weight. And there can be things that contribute to the number that really aren't your weight. You know, if you're, if you're wearing heavy shoes, if you're wearing um, multiple layers of clothing, um, those are contributing to the number you get, but they're not part of the mass of your body. They're, you know, there, there are other things that, that are influencing the number. Same thing happens with IQ. Yes, it's a measure of intelligence. It's not the same thing. There's other abilities and other influences that can change that, that number. Some of those are really important. For example, whether you speak a language as a native that the test is administered in. Um, if you don't, then your, your IQ is being grossly underestimated. 
Um, on the other hand, there are there are sometimes things that that can influence that. If the test is highly verbal, and you're just naturally a really verbose person who likes to read, that can inflate your score. Um, and then I have other colleagues who say, well, intelligence is more than just the global ability that helps us to do general reasoning tasks. It's really any, it, it, it's a collection of any ability that allows people to solve problems. And if that's your definition of intelligence, then yeah, IQ is not interchangeable with intelligence at all. But I like to tell people that IQ is the number we get. It's a measurement. Whether it's accurate or not for any particular person um, can can greatly vary. Um, but for most people, if, if they're part of the population the test is designed for, then it usually is a pretty accurate estimate of their intelligence. So if I understand you right, um, but basically what you're saying is that um, it has its own limitations as a measurement. Oh, okay, that's, that, that's what we have right now. And, you, you know, as, as what you've said, um, it's really diff difficult to capture intelligence, but at the moment, um, IQ is all we have. And I suppose um, you, you discuss this in greater detail in your book, and you just mentioned um, myth number 10. And mm -hmm. you have 35 myths on your, on your book in the know, the, in the know debunking 35 myths about human intelligence. But mm -hmm. um, Dr. Wang, what's your primary aim about this book, aside from debunking those 35 myths? Um, essentially, well, what are you trying to achieve with this book? My main goal is just to help non-experts understand what is and is not true about human intelligence research. There's not many areas in the sciences where non-experts make grand sweeping claims about the science that often they're very unfamiliar with. You see this, for example, in climate change research. Um, lately with the COVID pandemic, suddenly everyone's an expert in, in epidemiology. Um, but as far as the social sciences go, um, it's not unusual for outsiders to just pronounce, oh, here's something that's um, that's true about intelligence. And often it's not. Sometimes the experts put these myths to rest decades ago. So my goal is just to give people a friendly, accessible, one-stop shop for where they can um, learn what's true about intelligence and, and what's not. And I understand this This is available on Amazon and published by, who's the publisher? Cambridge University Press, and it's available mm -hmm. for pre-order from both of them. It's due at the end of October, that's when it'll come out. Okay, brilliant. And of course, Dr. Wan, aside from, um, you know, working on research, um, working on um, intelligence about IQ, you also carry out research relating to gifted education. So if you could mm -hmm. just, Tell us a bit more about um, your research in gifted education. Yeah, that's the field I came from originally um, with educational psychology. And so I'm interested in gifted programs and advanced programs. The basic philosophy behind these programs for the past hundred years is that just as children in special education who are struggling, who do not succeed with traditional teaching methods, um, often needs separate programs and, and adjustments and accommodations for their needs, that children who greatly excel, children who are at the other end of the normal distribution, um, that they need adjustments and accommodations and sometimes special classes and programs for them too. The I don't know how it is for you in the UK, but the American education system is really well designed for about the middle 60, 75 percent of kids. If your child is is average, give or take several points in either direction, the typical education system actually serves these kids very well. It's kids at the bottom about 20 percent, 15 percent, and the kids at the top um, 15 percent or so who need adjustments because the the classroom does not move at a pace that's educationally appropriate to them. So I study programs and issues around um, around making adjustments for children who, who greatly excel and what can we do to help them meet their full potential? What can we do to make these programs more equitable, et cetera? And of course, aside from your research about gifted education, um, another area of your um, cutting edge research is about malleability assumption. 
Um, can you please explain what malleability assumption is? Yeah, this is something I've only gotten into um, in the past year or so, and uh, I'm letting it stew quite a bit. So you're the you're the first person I talk with publicly about this. Uh, the malleability assumption is, is my personal term for the idea that people have that humans are really malleable, that it's really easy to change people. And I got into this through the human intelligence research because uh, a lot of programs, a lot of interventions we have to raise IQ um, either don't work at all or work temporarily. But when the, when the program stops, um, gradually people return to their, their old level of IQ. Um, and I talk about that in the book. I talk about what sort of interventions do raise IQ permanently. They're not um, the typical ones that people push. And so um, that got me reading into other areas about things like personality and uh, malleability of mental health traits. And I've just come to the conclusion that humans are not as easily influenced as our culture says they are, or that some branches of psychology and the social sciences, like social psychology, sociology, and other ideas, uh, other areas say they are. Um, Anyone who's been on a diet, anyone who's been in therapy knows that change is hard and permanent change is even harder. And so I don't know, I don't know why we're so eager to believe that short, brief interventions are, are going to be creating lifelong changes for most people. Um, to me, the evidence is pretty strong that, um, that we, have, we have difficulties and limits in how much people can be changed with formal programs and interventions and that permanent change takes some time um, that it's often not easy but it can be very rewarding i think my 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 example for that for what you said in in the, to support your um, malleability assumption is that I'm, I'm not very good with with maths i'm, I'm not mathematically inclined and um, i've already accepted that as a kid um, i was thinking like um, algebra calculus is not for me and mm -hmm. i think that that's um, a perfect example for your malle malleability assumption mm -hmm. and, and there's this idea that oh if we if we give kids the one right math experience oh if we if we make everybody take advanced algebra then people will like it be good at it and, and we'll get a lot more people trying to be engineers and that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, there are people who, with one teacher, um, you know, that can alter the course of their life. That doesn't seem to be very common. And when you're when you're trying to create an intervention to get more people choosing majors, college majors that they normally wouldn't be interested in, that, that's hard. Um, just giving people a weekend experience with math that's fun probably isn't going to be enough. Um, change is hard. It takes time. And um, there's nothing wrong with with recognizing that. Now let's move on to your another book. Um, um, it's statistic for um, social sciences, and I believe this will be very helpful for me. I'm about to start my PhD, and I have my own limitations with statistics, um, even during my undergraduate. And I, I've read a few reviews about here. Yeah, you've got quite um, you're quite skillful in trying to you know. Um, make it really understandable when you're talking about statistics. But um, tell us more about your book. Um, that's a statistics textbook. It was originally published um, the beginning of 2018. The um, second edition is coming out um, either at the end of this calendar year, 2020, or January 2021. Um, it's designed for undergraduates, and because um, that that's all I teach here at Utah Valley University, and it's a book that teaches basic first semester statistics to social science students who maybe have a little bit of math anxiety. This is not their thing. Um, and I build it around what's called the general linear model. The general linear model is a family of procedures um, for analyzing data. Um, and they're all interrelated and they're all the, the way that we consider um, the most common statistics um, as how instead of being in this collection of separate, unrelated abil um, um, procedures, that they're really just one procedure adapted to different types of data. 
And uh, we've had uh, a very positive result uh, and response from the first edition. And I'm really excited to get the second edition out there. Um, it was not fun working on two books <laughs> in the production process simultaneously. Um, I didn't choose when um, the book was being revised, but um, it was crazy having two books. I sometimes get two different copy editors asking for changes and stuff. And um, that's just the nature of of writing books and, and revising. Um, but yeah, my, my goal was to make statistics accessible, to make the connections between methods clear, and to um, to give people the tools they need to do basic data analysis in the future. And of course, um, that, that would be really useful um, whether you're doing um, research about intelligence or whether you're just basically doing um, qualitative um, research. Now, let's go back to um, intelligence. Um, I was just going to ask you because, you know, in your area, there's just a few people um, that you would recognize working on um, the field of intelligence. There's Flynn, um, yourself, and you've probably he heard about um, the British um, sociologist, um, Noah Carl. Um, I don't know if you've heard about him, but mm -hmm. have you heard about him? Yes, you, yes. You've probably, you've probably heard about, because you work in the same field, and you've probably worked, um, probably heard about his case, what happened to him. It, it was quite um, popular here um, when he was, um, shall we say, um, treated unexpectedly by Cambridge um, mm -hmm. when he had a conference in London about race and intelligence. And what, what do you take about that? Because when we're talking about intelligence and we try to link with in, um, intelligence, um, it tends to be very political and it tends to be very controversial. And why is that? Um, a couple of reasons. Um, uh, one is just the fact that a lot of this research contradicts um, some of the assumptions we have in a lot of liberal democracies in, in Europe and North America and worldwide. Um, you know, I live in a country where one of our founding documents says, all men are created equal. And when Thomas Jefferson wrote that, he was talking about morally equal, equal um, to the law, although America wasn't very good at fulfilling that um, for a long time. Um, and yet some people take that as to mean, well, all people have equal abilities. And then you have these intelligence researchers strolling in the room and saying, now, hold on. <laughs> Individual differences matter. Some people are smarter than others. Some people are never going to master fractions, no matter how hard we try. <laughs> Other people can master them in their sleep. This is important. And people don't like being told that, uh, especially in education, my field. Um, we really instill into teachers that every kid could succeed we have to work hard on this and the reality is that some people can't succeed and um, intelligence research tells some truths about individual differences that people don't want to hear now you mentioned um, race differences um, that's a topic that always sucks all the oxygen out of the room um, and and that is unfortunate in some ways because it's it's not the most important branch of, of research and intelligence. Um, I do talk about in the book, it's about 10% the length of the book and it's um, um, not nearly as controversial as some people might imagine. It's actually a, a pretty bland section. <laughs> but um, anytime you inject race into anything, um, people's anxiety level skyrockets and it starts um, interfering with, again, a lot of the, um, the beliefs that people have um, that they cherish and that they think are needed for a, a liberal democracy to, to function. And, you know, here you have psychologists and sociologists saying, you know, actually some of your cherished beliefs might not be empirically supported. And any time you start attacking people's um, most important beliefs, uh, the, the defenses are going to come out. And so I, I don't blame people for seeing this as controversial. I don't blame people for um, for getting emotionally involved. Um, but it, it's just the reality that a lot of the, the research coming out of here is not racist. It's not elitist. It's not, um, it's not discriminatory because facts are facts they cannot be any of those things 
And um, but they do contradict a lot of a lot of people's cherished beliefs. And I talk in the book about how people from you know both sides of the political aisle, from the left, from the right, um, can reconcile this and can marshal these facts to their advantage. Because I think that facts are value neutral, and that facts can support a wide variety of political and social goals. And I give people examples in the book about how, um, regardless of whether you're on the right or the left, um, there's there's nothing here to be afraid of and that that science can only help society get better. Um, I, I just wanna follow up on that question because I think what makes it even more controversial is that we don't seem to agree what intelligence is, like what you've alluded to earlier, what, what exactly is intelligence? Do we subscribe to the idea that it's a G factor or do we subscribe to Gardner's idea that it's um, mul multiple components? And aside from that, um, what 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 is race? Because some people say race is a social construct. Like, mm -hmm. how do you define someone of African descent? You know, like um, I'm sure in, in America you do have like the one 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 drop blood rule, um, and that really you know compounds a lot of discussions about you know mm -hmm. race intelligence. So how how do we navigate those issues? Yeah. And I talk in the book about the way that is a mainstream um, way of navigating these among intelligence researchers. Most do subscribe to a G theory that there's this general mental ability. And I, I talk about competing theories in the book and why why most people subscribe to, to G theory. And so um, whether you agree with G or not, it's just the idea that there is this global mental ability intelligence that helps people solve problems in a wide variety of, of contexts. Um, as far as, as definitions of things like race, yeah, there is a sociological component to race, unquestionably, and I, I, I recognize that. Um, if you define race as rigid categories of humans where there's no overlap, um, everyone within a, a group shares certain characteristics that no one outside of the group has. Um, th no, that's that's garbage. Race is race is not like that. Um, there there is no no gene that everyone of African ancestry has that no one else anywhere in the world has. That that's garbage. Um, the analogy I use in the book is that racial groups are extended families that they're a group of people who are more closely related to each other than they are to people outside the group. And that the boundaries between these are fuzzy, um, but, and these families are way too large for a family reunion to, to happen in one place. But the idea is that if we look at people who share a common ancestral population, then there are certain traits that appear more often, maybe not exclusively, and maybe not in everyone within the group, but that's how population geneticists um, think about racial groups. And so um, I, I like to think in terms of giant extended families. And some people with multiracial heritage um, have, have ancestors from multiple continents, and that doesn't invalidate the existence of their, their ancestral populations at all. Um, and there are sociological definitions that make, for example, racial groups and classifications in Brazil not compatible with those in the United States or in Australia. And that's okay too, but that's why I like talking about extended families. Um, and we shouldn't just take definitions of race off the shelf and assume that we all know what we're talking about. Now, Dr. Wan, let's get more topical. Um, you already briefly alluded about this earlier, but can you talk more about um, modern threats to um, academic inquiry? Of course, um, as, as in America and as in Britain, there's already you know, the cancer culture. But aside from that, what do you think is um, the threat to academic um, inquiry or the scientific community in general? Um, I think it depends on what branch of the scholarly community um, people are in. Um, in educational psychology in general, I would say that the biggest threat is just um, a monoculture, 
that um, the field of education is overwhelmingly dominated by people who are left of center, who have certain assumptions about people and their abilities, who, who think that um, the blank slate is a viable um, way of thinking about people. And, um, and it's very difficult for K to 12 teachers, for researchers, for, um, for people to, to escape that. Um, and if you, and I know people firsthand who have tried to do this, if, if you try to say at a professional development, if you try to say in a conference, now, wait, wait, wait. Um, I don't think that necessarily our reading score gap between wealthy kids and poor kids is solely because of SES. Let's talk about this. Um, you get shouted down. Um, and there's a monoculture about, for example, in, in education about standardized tests. They're seen as, as this great evil. We hate accountability testing. And I, I get why people don't like it, but um, I, I have had near riots when I presented to teachers about, hey, here's something useful standardized tests can do for you. Uh, just the idea that I think that there might be some pluses for teacher. I, I've, I've had people practically rebel at conferences. So I think that in education, that's the biggest threat. It's just a monoculture that um, outside ideas that are very reasonable are, aren't given a hearing, or if they are, um, there's an instant rebellion against them. Um, I think in some areas that the threat is, is funding. What's funded and what's not is often very political. Um, and we see this a lot with government agencies in the United States. Um, they're, they're more than happy to fund, um, uh, they're more than happy to fund, for example, um, breast cancer research. And I think there's value in funding that, but, um, men in the United States die at younger ages than women. Um, a lot of male cancers are more lethal than breast cancer is today. Why are we still disproportionately funding women's diseases? I'm not saying that that's not a, a um, uh, good it's not a good thing to do but let's ask ourselves why are why is the population that lives longer getting better funding for its diseases and the population that's living shorter well it's purely political because there are women's health lobbies um, it is very um politically rewarding the united states to stand up for women's issues not so much for men um and so i think that how government agencies use politics to shape their fundings what um, sort of topics and populations governments choose to fund is very political, and that's that's a big threat to academic freedom. And then you brought up the idea of of cancel culture and things like that before. Uh, I think this this threatens um, pretty much anyone who's not radically left right now. Historically, it's it's um, threatened anyone who isn't distinctly left of center. Um, I don't know how much we are currently in 2020 in a passing moment or whether this is going to be a permanent um, feature of academia, but yeah, it is getting harder and harder to speak up publicly um, about anything that's even centrist, let alone right of center. Um, I'm not going to win a lot of friends by saying, hey, you know, the blank slate's wrong. People aren't as malleable as you think, <laughs> um, because that greatly threatens a lot of left of center political goals and um you know i don't know if the cancel culture is going to come for me one day but um i think how severe the threats are and where they come from whether they come from within academia or outside um, greatly depends on what branch of research people are in i think the threats are greater from inside for humanities i think they're greater on the outside for for controversial research um i feel like i said it depends and it took a long time saying it mm -hmm. now um i want to follow up um the um issue um because um, a few months ago um the british psychological society published an article saying that um psychology has a problem with generalizability and by that they mean that you know studies are overwhelmingly weird participants and i'm sure you've heard of the term mm -hmm. by where they mean they mean western educated industrialized free democratic 
So what do you make of that? And I'm sure your um, area, especially um, IQ and intelligence, that's predominantly um, with, based from weird participants, because I haven't heard mm -hmm. of any, although we have culture fair intelligence tests, um, most of it is based from weird participants. Oh yeah, and um, yeah, I, I, whoever thought of the acronym "weird" for Western educated industrialized? Um, um, I don't remember what R is. <laughs> something and developed uh, or democratic. Um, brilliant, because um, um, Westerners are weird, um, both in terms of um, contemporary cultures. Uh, let's look at the largest ethno-cultural group in the world. It's Han Chinese. Um, you know, the, this one group grossly outnumbers all, all Westerners in, in the world combined. Um, you know, second, second largest, um, you know, it depends on how you divide them up, but, you know, the peoples of India. Um, you know, if life were fair, we would be publishing a heck of a lot more research out of out of East Asia and South Asia than than Western countries. Um, no, it is a major problem that that we're grappling with in, in psychology. And I, I think for the first time, we're really taking it seriously. I've been guilty of publishing um, research that's disproportionately from Westerners. Um, I'm trying to get better on that. Um, yes, intelligence research does um, generally have this disproportionate um, data from, from Western cultures. I did my part in addressing this. I, I published an article last year with a student where we dug up um, over 90 data sets from 31 non-Western, non-industrialized countries. And we ran the statistical results on them. And for over 95% of these, we got pretty much the same results that we get in Western countries where there's this one general G factor emerging from the data. Um, and I, I see this as a great vindication that our, our ways of thinking about intelligence and thinking about, um, about G, about general ability seems to be cross-cultural. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm greatly encouraged that people are following up on that. I know of at least one colleague who's um, using different criteria to find more data from, from non-Western cultures. Um, and so I feel like the problems of, of having weird um, data overwhelm the non-weird non data aren't as bad in intelligence research because um, definitely this G, this general ability does seem to not be unique to Western cultures. And um, I have colleagues who, who are doing more to expand um, to non-Western groups and nations. And it, it's rather impressive. We're getting some interesting research coming out of Nigeria and Sudan in recent years. Um, I have a colleague in Turkey who's trying to replicate some of my work. And so I think intelligence research is taking that that very seriously. Um, but I do recognize that some of the findings probably won't um, transport, generalize across cultures. And I'm excited to find out what, what those findings are. I'm not threatened by it at all. Um, if there's something that's unique to Western culture, let's find that out. That's useful. But the really cool stuff is the stuff that that binds humans together and that that makes us all one species and psychological interesting. That's that's what I'm most interested in. Um, I just want to move on to another topic, um, Dr. Um, Wan. Um, in an article on Wall Street Jour Journal, you said that undergraduates can improve psychology mm -hmm. through replication studies. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was um, in my undergraduate, that was a long time ago, um, um, we were discouraged from, um, you know, doing replication studies. Um, oh, yeah. So, so why, why would you say that, you know, um, we should replicate more studies? Um, well, psychology is still in the midst of this replication crisis where a lot of the findings that we had um, in intro to psych textbooks, a lot of the findings that we were using to influence policy and, and holding up as, as landmark understandings of people, uh, they weren't holding up. They weren't replicating. Um, I don't think we're out of the woods with that. I think that there's still a lot more to do. I think that there's more that we can discover about what we do and don't know. 
And so um, I do think we should be replicating more. And I think students are in the perfect position to replicate. Um, I also was uh, discouraged as an undergraduate from, from replicating. And um, we were encouraged to create our own study. And we only had one semester to design, collect data, analyze. Um, and it wasn't very good. <laughs> I don't feel like we learned anything. Well, I feel like we learned about how to conduct research, but I don't think we learned uh, or contributed to human knowledge about, about um, psychology. And so one experience my students have had when I've had them replicate, I, I give them a menu of, of studies they can replicate and they choose one as a group. Um, it frees them from having to design before they've been taught how to design. It, it takes time to do research. And so if you're gonna get the ethical approval and have enough time to do it, well, you've, you've got to pick something and design something really quick in like the second or third week of the semester. That's not enough time. Um, and so I feel like if we tell students, hey, you're gonna do something someone else did, they can still have the positive experience of collecting data, analyzing data, they make contributions to human knowledge about psychology and they still get to learn how to design, but they they're not under the pressure to design a study before they even know what to do. And that's the classroom learning as the semester progresses while they are out conducting another study. Um, and it's been very successful so far. And the group I worked with has already published some replications. Um, it's an inter-university group I work with very successful and it, it's it's a model I hope more people adopt and I, I think that um, especially at the graduate level having a student select their own replication to do um, carry it out and publish it should be standard part of, of training at the PhD level. Most of my um, YouTube subscribers most of um, people will be watching this are undergraduate students mm -hmm. and they probably be watching this because um, they're interested about your line of work. So what would you say they should replicate in the area of intelligence? Um, hmm. That's a really good question. Um, um, I, I would say that probably the, the easiest thing for undergraduates to replicate uh, would be some of the correlations between IQ and other variables out there. Since the 1990s, we've had an explosion in studies showing that intelligence correlates with many, many um, variables and life outcomes, far more than anyone 30 years ago thought it would correlate with, even, even the intelligence researchers. And so there's research about how IQ correlates with, for example, sense of humor um, or with personality traits that I think would be very doable for undergraduates to replicate. Um, and one thing that I've really liked about this field is that, yes, it can get technical. Yes, it can get complex. But if you understand a correlation and you can collect data and put into a computer and, and get a correlation, there's actually quite a bit of, of work that people can do. It doesn't always get super technical. And so um, I think hunting down a, a study in, in, a, in a journal about intelligence where we find the correlations between IQ and number of days people have missed work, sense of humor, a lot of those other variables would be very easy for undergraduates to replicate. Um, especially if they have access to samples that aren't in Western um, countries, that aren't college students, uh, it, it would be golden. And that would be something very publishable. And Dr. Wan, is there a particular individual who has the greatest influence to your work? Oh, gosh. Um, that's really hard. Um, um as far as putting me on this path of, of becoming an intelligence researcher, um, one of my professors in graduate school, uh, Dr. Joyce Juntoon, she she's probably most responsible for good or for bad for uh, all the stuff I've done. Um, she taught my um, class on intelligence, creativity, and giftedness at the graduate level, and 
Um, she was very much a proponent of, of intelligence research, even though it's not a very popular topic within gifted education, within um, educational psychology. Um, and she forced me and then encouraged me um, once I started getting more interested to read some of the stuff I wouldn't have read otherwise. Um, she asked tough questions about, about the data and how it goes against um, received wisdom in, in our culture. Um, scholarly work, it's really hard to escape the shadow when you're in the 21st century of, of Arthur Jensen. Um, whether you agree with him or not, um, he, he's the most influential intelligence researcher of the past 50 years. And um, it's really hard to be in an area of, of intelligence research without citing him. So um, for scholarly, who, who do I cite the most? That, that's who it is, but that's just because there, there's no other strong competitors. So th those would probably be, I'm sorry it was more than one answer, but um, Joyce Chantun is most responsible for putting me down this path um, as for who I, I sign, who I'm um, academically influenced the most with, it would be Arthur Jensen. And what, what's the most important thing you want the public to know about your work? Why, why you do research in intelligence and um, giftedness? Uh, the most important thing I want the public to just know is that intelligence is real and it matters. And so once you understand that, the rest of my work makes total sense. Um, I think too often our um, voices in our culture want to deny that some people are smarter than others. It's not elitist to say so. It's just a fact. That doesn't mean anyone's better than another, though. Um, but I think that um, the the best takeaway from my my work is that intelligence is real and that it matters. Everything else just follows logically from that. Um, my work, for example, with gifted kids with grade skipping. Um, you know, I, I did a study a couple of years ago, two of them actually, where I showed that grade skippers earn more money in adulthood compared to similar kids who don't skip a grade. You can't prove cause and effect with that, so don't don't skip your kid a grade hoping that they'll be rich. I can't prove cause and effect with my data. But why bother studying this? Well, it doesn't make sense unless you already accept the fact that intelligence is real and it matters. And then studying things like grade skipping, advanced courses, um, whether intelligence is cross-cultural, it all makes sense. It all flows from that, all my work does. And um, I'm just wondering why is it that we're more resistant of accepting um, the idea about you know um, people having different um, intellectual abilities, but when it comes to physical um, physical abilities, we're more accepting of the fact that you know so, some people just swim faster than you do, and some people are just you know genetically predispositioned to run faster than you. But when it comes to intelligence, we seem to be a more a bit resistant about that. Um, a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is. Um, too many people have made the mistake of of um, equivalent uh, of making intelligence differences the equivalent of moral or human worth differences, and I reject that completely. Uh, but too many people say, "Oh, well, if you're smarter, you must be better," and I, I think that that's an idea and an assumption we need to stamp out because it's definitely not true. Beyond that. Um, it's also just seen as bad manners to hold yourself up as being so smart. Um, you know, not many people outside of Mensa, the, um, the largest high IQ society in, in the world, uh, do that. It's it's seen as being really um, chintzy, really, um, um, you know, really déclassé to. Um, value your intelligence and hold it up and, and show how much it matters uh, it seemed to it's it's more humble it's more socially acceptable and you get invited to parties more if you downplay your know-it-allness and if you downplay um you know emphasizing that some people are dumb um you know i i think that um there is a lot of of um cultural um, jealousy also about um, smart people. Um, I have a 
Um, a great quote that I have um, somewhere in the book saying that intelligence is like money. Um, publicly, you say that it doesn't matter much, but privately, you wish you had a lot. And I think that publicly, you say it doesn't matter much is a very strong current in our culture. But, but there's also the idea that, you know, that, that different forms of intelligence, because before it was just, you know, the IQ. And now I don't, I don't know how many we've got. Um, I, I, I can't remember the last time I've checked, but we've got emotional intelligence. We've got musical intelligence. And so we seem to be more uh, also accepting that, you know, some people are just musically inclined or some people are seem better able to manage their emotions. But it, it's just really different when it comes to, you know, IQ, numeracy and verbal fluency. Yes, and I talk about some of those uh, alternate intelligences in in the upcoming book, um, In the Know. And um, some of those are more empirically supported than others. And we can have a good theoretical legitimate debate about whether some of these other abilities are intelligences or not. Uh, a good one is Gardner's uh, bodily kinesthetic intelligence. This is the intelligence that helps someone be a good dancer or a good athlete. Um, I don't think it's cognitive at all. Um, I don't think it deserves the term intelligence because it, to me, intelligence needs to be cognitive. Uh, but we can have a debate about that egalitarian theories about how there's all these intelligence out there um, are very popular because they give people hope. Oh, if you're not good at the sort of intelligence you need to succeed in school, well, there's still hope. Maybe there's one of these other intelligences that, that you're smart and maybe you're really good at social intelligence, emotional intelligence, musical intelligence, etc. Um, and I think how much that argument holds water depends greatly on how much you think these other things warrant the label intelligence. Mainstream scholars don't think that most of them warrant intelligence or they think that they are just forms or manifestations of general intelligence. Um, and so that's my perspective. I think that people like a lot of these alternative theories because they are so egalitarian. Um, but people have tried to apply them to the real world before the evidence was there justifying that. And that's definitely true with emotional intelligence, definitely true with Gardner's theories. Um, and, and I think that we should get data first before trying to apply things to the education system or to society. But mm -hmm. other people just want to get things done and mm -hmm. they like to apply theories quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Wan, you also have your own blog. Um, what's your favorite piece? <laughs> uh, yeah, my site, russwarn.com. I, um, I post, um, depending on how busy I am, sometimes it's weekly, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, you know, I like them all. Um, probably, um, you know, gosh, you're, you're asking me some pretty good questions. Um, asking me to pick my my one favorites a, a little difficult i like the ones that um showcase some of my um colleagues work uh, i posted one um just last week from my colleague um jonathan way where i call one of his um graphs the most important graph in educational psychology um i i really like showcasing the work of my colleagues because um uh, we don't get enough attention in, in some of these fields. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm browsing through it right now. Um, my, my colleague, uh, Joni Lakin, has shown that um, increasing the number of, of um, tests we use to select children for gifted programs does not increase um, diversity. Um, she showed that changing the, the cut scores is the best way to increased diversity of gift, gifted programs. Amazing study. I love showcasing um, Dr. Lakin's work. Um, so again, I'm sorry I couldn't just pick one, but um, um, I really do like talking about my colleagues' work because some of them are very innovative people, 
doing um, research that deserves a, a larger audience. Mm -hmm. So th those are brilliant starting points for those who want to follow your work. So what I'll do is um, I'll pop in those um, links on the video description box. So right. anyone who's watching this can you know um, read them in more detail. Now, okay. uh, you've mentioned earlier, um, you're, you're very busy. Um, you, you have a very busy academic life, but how do you relax? What's, what's your distressing outlet? Um, you know, the, the most common way for me to relax is to um, just spend time with my kids. I have four children, ages six and under, and they keep me plenty busy. Um, my, I probably have the most um, unusual hobby in, in all of academia, but in my spare time, um, I also review live theater. I've been doing that for over 10 years. Um, and I, I run a nonprofit here in Utah that um, that reviews shows and gives artists feedback. Um, and so I I go to when there's not a pandemic going on. Um, I go to as many plays as my busy family life will let me. And um, that's that's been a, an interesting um, um, dual life to live. Um, the people in the arts world are surprised. I'm a scientist, and the scientists are surprised that. Um, I'm an arts critic, and so that that's how um, pretty much all my time spent is family, work, and and the arts. Because I would imagine some people would say you're you're kind of like an empirical guy, and when you're Very. reviewing as a critic, well, let's let's um, it's it's arguably objective, you know. <laughs> yeah, it it it's sometimes my scientist mind gets in the way mm -hmm. of something I'm watching, and and. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's it's a rewarding hobby to have, and, and it's mm -hmm. it's my way of building the arts community locally. Mm -hmm. And I also see that you're on Parler. Um, for for those who's not aware of it, um, this is a new um, social media that I just heard it about 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 um, two three months ago. Because mm -hmm. um, I follow Katie Hopkins on Twitter, and she was um, um, banned on Twitter. So um, and she she announced that she's on Parler, but what would you say to those people who say that this is actually a far right version of Twitter? Um, um, it is it more populated by people on the right than the left? Yeah. Um, but that's who's getting kicked off of Twitter. Um, I'm not a political person at all. I find politics distasteful um, and actually pretty boring. <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons why um, I can write in a sober manner about topics that do get politically controversial. Uh, and so I don't really follow anyone very political on Parler. And that makes it a very lonely place. <laughs> Because it is right now dominated by political voices. I wish we would get more um, people who aren't interested in politics on it. There's not a lot of scientists talking about science there. Um, but, you know, when I first said, oh, you know, anyone else here on Twitter that's that's on Parler? I had someone say, oh, you know, they quoted the Wikipedia page. Oh, it, it's attracted the far right. It's attracted, you know, extremists and racists. And I just replied and said, well, so is Twitter. Uh, you know, and here we are now, you know, on Twitter, which does the same thing. Um, I see as an alternate to Twitter. Um, there are some Twitter refugees, uh, like the person you said there. Um, I'm not following a lot because I'm more interested in just following fellow scientists, following fellow um, thinkers. Uh, and, and there's not a lot of people there who are apolitical. Um, but um, I don't see it as designed for the far, far right. I haven't seen anything that's far right, mostly because I'm not following politics anyway. And I wish there were a larger science community um, and psychology community on Parler so that um, so that we could have conversations and more outlets. Because I feel like the more conversations we have about scientific research in more places, the better off science is, the better off the public is. Um, but I it. It's Twitter with fewer features, really. That's that's been my impression, but that's just because I'm not, I'm not someone who's seeking out the political conversation. Um, yeah, so. and it's nice to have an alternative. Um, and what would you think you would be doing if you didn't work as a psychologist? Um, 
I don't really know because, like I said, I, I wanted to be a psychologist when I was a teenager. Um, um, I'm not sure. Um, probably something with data analysis. Um, I could imagine being a data scientist. If you kicked me out of academia tomorrow, that's probably where I would go. Uh, maybe I would have gone into genetics, but I'm not sure how much of that is. Oh, yeah, I've always been interested in biology and how much of that is just um, needing to learn more about genetics uh, because that's going to be an, incre an increasingly important um, influence on psychology. So um, I'm not entirely sure, but I probably would have done something um, related to ideas because um, I'm far more interested in ideas than I am, than I am in, um, in, in anything else. I, I think that's why academia works for me. And finally, Dr. Wan, what else is on the pipeline? Um, tell us about your any other upcoming books or any other upcoming lectures. No new books. I have vowed to my wife. Um, mm -hmm. Writing a book takes its toll um, on my family and uh, with us just barely having um, a, a baby um, just this past June. I, I need to take a break from writing writing books. Um, definitely not writing anything new before um, our, our youngest is in kindergarten, which is you know quite a, quite a ways away. Um, Research-wise, um, I'm working on some more stuff with intelligence tests, understanding what they do and don't measure. Um, I'm lucky in Utah to have um, a large. Um, Pacific Islander and Native American population nearby. So I'm trying to see um, how applicable test design for people in the United States are for these cultural groups, um, because you can't just assume that a test works across groups. You have to test that empirically. Um, and so I, I'm trying to open up uh, a study into those areas. Um, I've been sucked more into um, history. I've always been interested in history, but um, uh, because of some controversies in Gifted Ed, there's some people trying to to disavow or whitewash some of that field's history. And I'm working with a colleague um, at the University of Alabama. We're um, writing more about the history of, of Gifted Education and intelligence research and um, clarifying misconceptions. And so I'm... Um, being sucked into reading a lot more old stuff. And um, some of it holds up well, some of it doesn't, but being able to clarify um, what people historically intended these tests to do or not, um, what they imagined gifted education could do or, or not, um, I think still has a lot to tell us today in the 21st century. And so I'm, I'm too scatterbrained to do just one thing. I'm, I'm doing a little bit in three different areas um, right now. Well, it's been an insightful conversation with you, Dr. Wan, but unfortunately our time is up. But uh, thank you for sharing your time and your expertise and thank you for talking about your book. Um, I'll put all those links in the video description box. Um, again, thank you for sharing your time and I look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank all you. right, thanks for having me, Dennis. I'll see you later.